Okay, hello everyone. This is Dr. Lyons, and in this chapter, we're going to be talking about uh, the biotic things that affect organisms in between the tides. So this is the second part of the chapter on the rocky intertidal zone. Okay, rocky intertidal zones such as this one here, uh, which is a uh, uh, which is a picture from uh, from Oregon. Okay. So in this chapter, or in this part of chapter 11, we're going to be talking about biotic challenges, right? So challenges coming from the fact that there are other living things around you if you are something that lives in the intertidal zone. Uh, and one of those challenges is that there's limited space. Uh, and limited space means that there's competition. So back in chapter 10, we learned a lot about competition. We learned about how there is... Uh, intraspecific competition within the species. We learned about how there's interspecific competition, so uh, competition between different species. Uh, and all that competition comes down to the fact that there are that there are very important resources that animals and plants need. If you live in the intertidal zone, space is very much one of those one of those things that you need. You need you need a place to to live. So there's a lot of competition for space. So, for instance, some of the, the nasty things that the animals and plants will do in the intertidal zone is they will grow over things that need to photosynthesize. So if you uh, grow over the top of an algae or a plant, you have essentially killed that algae or plant because they need the sun in order to photosynthesize. So you can do that. Uh, you can undercut your competitors. Uh, so what you see here is two different types of barnacles. And you can see how this barnacle looks like it's kind of underneath this one. What this barnacle is actually doing is it is growing underneath this one and it's popping it very slowly, popping it off the rocks. So eventually what will happen is this barnacle here and this one, they're both going to get popped off the rocks. Uh, and once they're popped off the rocks, they're done for. They're, they're dead. Uh, so you can undercut your competitors. Uh, and this is a picture of a palm kelp. Uh, and so any of the, the algae underneath this kelp is, is now pretty much donezo uh, because any of that algae is going to need light and they're not going to get it with this palm kelp above them. Things that live in the intertidal zone, they tend to colonize space very, very quickly. Uh, because space is such an important limiting resource, anytime that there's new space that becomes available, it gets colonized very quickly. So say, for instance, uh, there's a storm and it turns over some rocks so that now there are rocks with bare spaces facing up. Those will get colonized by barnacles and algae and mussels very, very quickly uh, because that, that any of that any free space is, is gold in the rocky intertidal zone. OK, predators are another really important biotic challenge for things in the rocky intertidal zone. Uh, and they're really important. Because if you live in the rocky intertidal zone, remember, you're living in a world where you're in the air part of the day uh, and you're out of the air. So you're in the water part of the day. So you need to deal with both water based and land based predators. Right. If you're something like a uh, if you're something like a mussel, you might have to deal with both raccoons and fish eating you. Uh, raccoons are actually really important predators in the rocky intertidal zone. Uh, at low tides, raccoons will go into rocky intertidal zones and they'll eat crabs and mussels and, and things like that. So yeah, so imagine that some uh, there's a there's an animal out there that needs to deal with both raccoons and with fish eating it. Uh, and those are animals that are in the rocky intertidal zone have to deal with those problems. So the, the abiotic stressors and the biotic stressors lead to zonation in the rocky intertidal. Uh, so this zonation is, is probably one of the most important defining features of rocky intertidal zones. Uh, and what I mean by zonation is that species occur in distinct bands in the rocky intertidal zone. So for instance, take a look at this picture, right? We see up here, uh, we have only, uh, uh, this is mostly uh, what are known as lichens. So we have lichens up there, we have barnacles, and we have uh, maybe some limpets up there. Uh, then a little bit further down, you see a different set of things. This, I think, is a different type. It's hard to tell in the picture, but this is a different type of barnacle living there. 
Uh, a little further down, we see, okay, there's some muscles that are, that are living in that area and some more muscles there and there. You get a little further down and then you get into this area where you see all of these anemones. Uh, a little further down, you get into this area where you have this, uh, these seaweeds, these kelps, uh, or, or actually, I'm sorry, those are rockweeds. And then even further down, then you get into the area where you see lots of sea stars, right? So things occur in distinct bands in the intertidal zone, right? You don't see sea stars up here and you don't see limpets down here, right? They occur in distinct areas. So let's think about what might affect where you find these things. Why is it that sea stars are down here, but not up here? And why is it that limpets that are up here, why don't you find them down there, right? Why is it that they are, that each species is relegated to a specific zone uh, and they're only found in that zone and not found in other areas? So a lot of what we know about this uh, comes from this guy. Uh, so this is a, a Scottish guy by the name of uh, Joseph Connell, uh, and he did his PhD dissertation on this exact thing, on zonation in the rocky inner tidal. Uh, and he did this specifically on barnacles, right? So another reason why barnacles are so important to us is because uh, we, we know so much about zonation because of them. Uh, and Joseph Connell was interested in zonation. Uh, specifically, he was interested in two types of barnacles. So he was interested in little gray barnacles and he was interested in rock barnacles, right? So two different species of barnacles. Uh, and he did some very, uh, very simple observations and experiments to determine why it is that little gray barnacles are only up in the higher part. And why is it that rocky bar rock barnacles are found, you know, throughout the entire range? Uh, and so what he found was was kind of interesting, right? So if you look at baby barnacles, right? So you if you look at where the little larva of barnacles settle, the the little gray barnacles settle throughout this whole area, right? So when they're babies, they can be found, you know, above high water down to the middle part of the intertidal. But then when you look at where you find them as adults, you know, so as, as fully formed adults, that band kind of shrinks down. So you don't find them up here where you find them as babies and you don't find them down here where you find them as babies. Similar thing going on with the rock barnacles, right? So when they're larva, when they're little babies, you find them from high water all the way down to, to low, uh, low water. Whereas, uh, uh, whereas the adults, you don't find them up here at high water and you don't find them all the way down there. You know, so what is going on here? You know, why is it that say uh, a rock barnacle baby right there, uh, you find it right there, but you don't find it there in as a, an adult. Uh, and why is it that you find baby rock barnacles here in the lower part of the inner tidal, but you don't find them there as adults? Essentially something is going on. Uh, so that the baby rock barnacles that settle here, something is going on that's causing them to die so that they don't make it to adulthood. Right, because they're settling here, so there's babies there, but some for some reason they don't survive into adulthood, which is why you don't find any adults up there. Uh, and that's what Joseph Connell was wanted to figure out. You know, what is going on such that such that the rock barnacles here die? And why do the rock barnacles here all die? And why is it that the little gray barnacles here, why do they all die? And why is it that the little gray barnacles here, why do they all die? You know, what's going on there? And so he did some uh, really simple experiments. Uh, so he so he kind of moved barnacles around and he did some very basic uh, uh, experiments where what he found was that for both of the, the little gray barnacles uh, and the rock barnacles, uh, the babies that settle way too high, essentially desiccation gets them. So it's too dry, it's too hot up there and they and they 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 die because of that. So they dry out and then they're dead. So any of the little babies that landed there and landed there, they basically picked a really crappy place to, to settle. Uh, they picked the, the wrong place to settle because then they're destined to dry out and die. Uh, it's a cruel world. And so if you're a barnacle that settles in the wrong place, you know, that's just what happens to you. You, you dry out and then you're dead. Uh, so that's what happens in the, the upper parts of the range of the barnacles. What happens in the lower parts is a little more interesting. 
so the 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 uh, uh, the little gray barnacles when they settle too low they have to deal with competition from the rock barnacles so rock barnacles are the competitive dominant here basically any little gray barnacles that settle into their area they kick them out they say nope not allowed here this is our turf and so they will undercut them and pop them off the rocks so any little gray barnacles that settle too low they have you know done a bad job of picking a place to live because they're in the turf of the uh, of the rock barnacles and so they get popped off the rocks and then they're dead uh, with the the rock barnacles the ones that settled far too far down they have to deal with a similar problem as the as the little gray barnacles so when they settle too far down now they're in the area where they get eaten by whelks and they're in the area where they have to compete for mussels and mussels are competitive dominance to them so essentially if they settle too low then they have to deal with getting eaten or if they deal with or they have to deal with competition so essentially there's this sweet spot right so if you are a rock barnacle you need to settle here because if you don't settle here if you settle above that you dry out and die if you settle below that you get eaten or you get out competed and if you're a little gray barnacle right if you settle too high you dry out and die and if you settle too low you get out competed by the by the rock barnacles right so there's this sweet spot where they can live uh, and what determines that sweet spot is is how well they're able to deal with drying out and the competitors and predators that they have to deal with right so that is why there is zonation in the inner title uh, the upper bound of of each band for each species is, is set by how well they can deal with stress from desiccation and the lower bound of each band for each species is set by by predation and competition so what you see is uh, is you have you know little gray barnacles settling throughout this little area as larva same with the rock barnacles they settle through a pretty wide area uh, but it's only the ones in the middle survive right the ones where there's red here those ones are dead so it's just those ones that settled in the middle part actually are able to survive in the rock intertidal zone okay so that's a little bit about how about how abiotic and biotic factors affect zonation. Uh, another thing that I want to talk to you about in the context of the intertidal zone in the in, in the context of uh, biotic factors, so species affecting each other, uh, is what's known as the keystone predator concept. So there is a really interesting story here that includes these three groups. Uh, and you'll find when you're doing the uh, when you're doing the uh, competition lab, uh, you're going to learn a little bit more about these three groups because the, the competition lab that you're going to be doing, uh, I designed it after this interaction that's going on here. So there's three key players here. So we have the sea star, Pisaster uh, acracius, uh, commonly known as the ochre sea star. Uh, you have the mussel, Middleus californius, uh, and you have various seaweeds uh, such as fucus. Uh, so you have these three key players and these players are found you know throughout the west coast of the united states and in, in, uh, in canada you know so like british columbia washington oregon california uh, that's where these things are living uh, and what's going on here is is the sea star is having a major effect uh, essentially in the sea stars realm uh, which is down here it looks like this uh, if you go above the sea stars realm, this is more what it looks like. So you can see, obviously, these sea stars are having a big effect. Where the sea stars are hanging out, you don't see a lot of mussels. Where the sea stars aren't able to get to because it's too dry for them, you see lots of lots of mussels. And this story was kind of put together by this guy, Dr. Robert Payne, who is a uh, who has passed away now, but uh, but he did this work when he was a professor at the University of, of Washington. Uh, and he did a really, really simple experiment, right? So he went out to an to a to an area, you know, with uh, a rocky intertidal area where there are uh, where there are seaweeds, where there are gooseneck barnacles, where there are sea stars and where there are mussels. And he did a very simple thing. He took all of the sea stars and he removed them. Uh, just to see what would happen. And what he found over time 
is that mussels tended to take over. So mussels colonized that area and they kicked out all of the barnacles, they kicked out the gooseneck barnacles, and they kicked out all of the, the seaweeds. So what he essentially figured out is that the mussels are the competitive dominant in this situation, right? So barnacles are really good at outcompeting those other ones. They kick out the other things. Uh, because they're just so good at taking over space and growing over their their competitors. So so but what you find when you have sea stars around is that the sea stars control the muscles. They keep the muscles in check. Uh, and in doing so, they allow these other things to grow. They allow gooseneck barnacles and gray barnacles and seaweeds. They allow all of those other things to grow by controlling the, the muscles, by, by keeping uh, the muscles in check. So what he essentially came up with, and, and so this is a picture of Dr. Robert Payne, uh, and there's some sea stars that he's removing from an area. So what he essentially was able to figure out uh, was that the sea star was what's known as a keystone predator, which is a, a concept that he termed to describe the sea star. So these sea stars have a large effect on this community by, by controlling the competitively dominant organism. Right, so in this case, this, the, the muscle is the competitively dominant organism and left unchecked, the muscle will take over the area and push out all of the other weaker uh, organisms. Uh, but the sea star comes to the rescue, the sea star controls those muscles uh, and keeps those muscles from getting too abundant so that those other things stand a fighting chance. Uh, and why he called this these things keystone predators uh, has to do with, uh, with, believe it or not, with Roman architecture. So Roman architecture, uh, how it's kind of built uh, is through arches, right? So how a lot of like Roman buildings and, and Roman amphitheaters are built is you have these archways, right? So you have an arch that looks something kind of like this. Uh, and those arches are made of kind of square shaped blocks. Uh, but at the top of these square shaped blocks, you'll have a, a trapezoidal shaped rock, right? So you have this rock right here uh, that kind of has this, this trapezoid shape. Uh, and it's that rock right there, that stone in that shape is what allows this whole arch to take place, right? By, by having this trapezoid shape, basically the column, this, this whole archway can stand. So this keystone rock, which is what this is called, uh, ho holds up the whole archway. Uh, and without that keystone rock, the archway just doesn't stand. Uh, and so it's the same with these ecosystems here, right? So without this keystone predator, the ecosystem is completely different uh, because then the muscle completely takes it over. Okay, so in the context of that, I wanted to talk a little bit about what's known as sea star wasting disease, uh, which is having an effect on, on rocky intertidal ecosystems in the, the west coast of the United States. So Pisaster acratius and about 40 other species, uh, both in the Atlantic and in the Pacific, have been affected by wasting disease. Uh, and so what wasting disease does is it causes the tissue to, to waste away. Uh, and if too much of the tissue wastes away, that can cause death. So like this Pisaster sea star, this, this is a goner uh, because the tissue is just completely wasted away and it just kind of turns in, into a goop. This is uh, showing a timeline as of 2014. So 2013 and 2014 was when wasting disease was really the, the strongest. Uh, and so throughout different parts of uh, uh, of the west coast of the U.S. and of Canada. Uh, in 2013 and 2014, there was major uh, sea star wasting where, where large, large amounts of sea stars were wasting away and dying. Uh, where this, uh, at least to me, was the strongest was throughout the Oregon coast uh, because that's where I was living at the time. So there was lots and lots of sea star wasting up there. Right, So huge, huge die-offs of, of sea stars as a result of this disease. Uh, and so this is kind of showing kind of a before, you know, so throughout a lot of, you know, more Oregon and Northern California, California, you would see huge, huge amounts of these sea stars. But uh, you have sea stars turning from healthy to having these lesions 
to losing limbs, to losing multiple limbs and completely dying, you know, that has completely transformed scenes like this to scenes that are completely barren of sea stars. These are sightings as of 2016. Uh, so you can see it's been found, you know, by now pretty much throughout the whole uh, of North America, right? So you find it everywhere in North America. So in 2014, some scientists figured out what the actual pathogen was that was causing sea star wasting disease. Uh, and they determined that it was something known as a densovirus, uh, a densovirus of the particular uh, family uh, uh, Parvoviridae. Uh, so this Parvoviridae uh, seems to affect sea stars and gets into their tissue and causes them to have lesions like poor Patrick sea star here uh, and causes their, their limbs to start to degrade and, and fall away. However, there's something really interesting about this densovirus. So these same researchers, they, they looked at museum specimens of Pisaster from 1942. And what they actually found was that the densovirus was present inside of that sea, those sea stars from 1942. However, in 1942, you didn't see sea star wasting disease. It wasn't until about 2013 that people first started noticing sea star wasting disease. So somehow it seems like in the 1940s, you know, leading up through the 2000 teens, it seems like sea stars were living with this densovirus inside of them. Uh, but something must have changed in 2013 that then caused it, the densovirus, to start having a major effect on them uh, and to start killing them. So the really the, the, the key question is, you know, why were there no outbreaks of sea star wasting disease before? If they had the virus inside of them, we would expect that they would have had those outbreaks before, but they weren't. So what was going on here? So there was a study done in Puget Sound uh, in 2016 that kind of clarified this. So what this, uh, this map is showing you here, uh, the colors you see uh, refers to sea surface temperature uh, during, I believe this was during the 2014 summer. So dark red means that there is, uh, means that the waters are really uh, warm. White means that the waters are of normal temperature. Uh, and then these circles here that are purple and white, uh, the purple refer, uh, so these circles refer to uh, surveys. Uh, and, and so like this purple one here means that 100% of the sea stars found in that area were diseased, right? So 100% had it. Uh, whereas if it's a uh, circle is all white, uh, it means that 100% in that area were completely healthy. Uh, so I want you to compare, you know, these circles here that are up in this area to these circles here that were down in this particular area. Uh, so what you will probably notice is that up here, you find a lot more circles that are fully purple right, that have a lot of incidence of sea star wasting disease. Whereas down here, you know, these ones uh, at the most are three quarters filled, uh, but a lot of them have, you know, less than half of the individuals with sea star wasting disease. Uh, so there's more sea star wasting disease here than down here. And if you look at the temperatures, it's hotter up here than it is down here, right? So that's a pretty big clue. Uh, this seems to indicate that temperature uh, when it's hotter, sea star wasting disease has a stronger effect. Uh, so it seems like something, uh, something about warm waters seems to set off the virus so that then the virus starts to have an effect on the sea stars. So essentially the higher temperature there is, the more disease. So it seems like the, the temperature sets off that virus so it starts having an effect or perhaps higher temperatures weaken the immune system of sea stars so that they then fall victim to the, 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 the densovirus. Uh, a kind of an interesting finding that they came up with uh, that I don't think is still completely understood why this is, uh, is that larger sea stars uh, tended to have more of an infection. Uh, most likely it has something to do with the immune system of larger versus smaller sea stars. Uh, but my understanding is that is that still through today, it's not completely understood why that is. So kind of sad thing of this is that with increasing temperatures, we're likely going to see more of this. 
So when this virus, uh, uh, when, when C-star wasting was really strong in 2013 and 14, uh, this was also when there was very, very warm temperatures throughout the Pacific Ocean, right? So the west coast of, of North America, so the waters there were very warm during those two summers, uh, which seems to be why there was so much sea star wasting disease uh, at that particular time. So as temperatures, temperatures increase, unfortunately, we're going to see more of this, uh, which is then kind of problematic uh, because we just learned about how sea stars are the keystone predator here how they control the muscles and they prevent muscles from taking over. So what we will expect to see in the future is as sea stars become less and less common because of this disease, we're gonna see more and more muscles because there's gonna be nothing to control them. Okay, so that's all I've got to tell you about the intertidal zone. Uh, in the next chapter, we'll talk about a different ecosystem.